Let's look back to Acts chapter number 20, if you would, with me. And I'm going to read verses 36 through 38 once again, a little bit faster, though. The Bible says, And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. Now, as we saw on Sunday night, Paul's third missionary journey is coming to an end. This journey started with Paul traveling throughout the regions of Galatia and Phrygia so that he could strengthen the faith of those who have already turned to Jesus for salvation. We saw that back in uh, Acts chapter number 18. These young believers had also made the decision to live their lives according to the life and teachings of Jesus the Christ, the Savior. From there, Paul's third missionary journey took him to the city of Ephesus, where he spent the majority of this expedition and where we've uh, spent the majority of our time talking. And up here on our map, you'll see, did I pass the map already? Wow, I'm having technical difficulties for sure. Let's see here. Let's go backwards, previous. All right, here we go. Nope. Good night. I'm doing horrible tonight, folks. All right, let's try this. I'll go click right on that. There we go. All right, on our map here, we can see how he went up here through uh, of Phrygia and Galatia, and then he went over here to Ephesus. And as I just said, he spent most of the third missionary journey there. In fact, he talks about spending three years warning people day and night. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a second. After that, he then visited Macedonia and Achaia, as we've talked about before, and then turned back around and headed uh, to Philippi, caught a ship up here in Neapolis, and crossed the Aegean Sea to Troas. From there, they made their way down here through the Aegean Sea. And where we find them at the end of, of, of verses 36, 37, and 38, at the end of Acts chapter number 20, is right here in Miletus. Now, though Paul would have liked to have seen the members of the church of Ephesus one more time, we said on Sunday night that he knew that time was short because he wanted to make it all the way from over in this region down to Jerusalem by the day of Pentecost, which was less than five weeks away at this point in time. So when his ship docked there at Miletus, a city that was about 30 miles away from Ephesus, Paul sent word to the elders uh, of the Ephesian church and let them know that he was nearby and that he wanted to fellowship with them. The elders eagerly came and met with him. However, he quickly let them know or made sure that they knew that this meeting was a serious meeting. It was of a serious nature. Uh, he told them this. Now, behold, I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. By the time verses 36 through 38 are written, Paul has finished delivering his final admonition to the men of Ephesus. And then we have recorded what we opened up the message with tonight, verses 36, 37, and 38. And here in these verses, we read how that Paul knelt down and prayed. And those men, the elders or leaders of the church in Ephesus, began to weep. And they fell on Paul's neck. They began to embrace him and to, uh, to uh, kiss him because they were sorrowful that they were not going to see him anymore. They then accompany him down to uh, the, the harbor or down to the seacoast where he catches his ship that eventually is going to help him make his way back to Jerusalem. Now, with all that said, the question that we ask ourselves is this. Why were these men moved by the fact that they wouldn't see Paul again? And the answer, as we mentioned on Sunday night, was because they saw Paul as more than just a preacher of the gospel. They saw Paul as more than just a mentor, someone who had instructed them. The Ephesian elders embraced Paul, kissed Paul, wept over Paul because they saw him as a father figure. They saw him, this man, who was just four years earlier a stranger to them. They saw him now uh, in a way where they considered him closer than a biological brother or a biological family member. Paul had built some relationships in Ephesus that would last forever. He had a love for the Ephesians and the Ephesians had a love for him. 
How was he able to do this? How was he able to build these uh, relationships, these strong friendships? The answer to this question can be found in his last admonition to the elders of Ephesus. And that's what I want us to talk about tonight is friendships that last forever. Friendships that last forever. We're going to look here uh, back at this last challenge that Paul gave to these elders, to these, uh, these leaders uh, from the church in Ephesus, and we're going to see exactly what the recipe is for building friendships that will last forever. Now, in verse number 18, Paul began his final challenge to the elders by saying, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. In other words... He is saying to these men, you know what type of a testimony I had from the first day I set foot in Asia. Now, did you notice here in verse number 18 that he he does not say Ephesus. He says Asia. He says, ultimately, you know what the testimony, what type of a testimony I had from the, uh, the day I set foot in Asia. Really, what he's saying is, you know uh, that my testimony was the same whether I was in Ephesus or whether I was somewhere else in this region known as Asia. I had a testimony that was the same. It never changed from the day I set foot in Asia before I even came to Ephesus. Until now, you know what type of a testimony I have had. In verse number 19, Paul then begins to talk about this testimony. And it's from this testimony that we are going to find this recipe for building friendships that last forever. At the beginning of this verse, the Bible says, serving the Lord. Serving the Lord. Now, from uh, that phrase right there, we see that Paul's service to the Lord was instrumental in him building these relationships or these friendships with the people there in Ephesus. Serving the Lord. He tells us three things about serving the Lord. Look back to verse number 19 with me, if you would. He says here, serving the Lord with all humility of mind. The first thing that he mentions is humility. Now, I know that we, when we think of humility and meekness, uh, we think uh, uh, about a person who is, is humble, who, who does not brag on themselves, who is not filled with pride, and that is true. Uh, I want us to make sure that we understand, though, that he, ta- he says here with all humility of mind. That's important. Um, I've said before, and you've probably heard other preachers say, that a truly humble person will not think that he or she is humble. So with that in mind, someone might look at what Paul says here in verse number 19 and say, well, does that mean that Paul really wasn't humble if he said that he served the Lord with all humility of mind? Well, the key is the end of what he said there, of mind. In other words, he wasn't saying that outwardly I am a humble person. Outwardly I am a meek person. Outwardly, I have no pride about me. And when people see me and the way I carry myself, uh, I am uh, they know that I am not a prideful person. That's not what he said. He's not talking about outwardly. He's talking about inwardly. He says with all humility of mind. In other words, what he's saying is, as I served the Lord, I kept in front of me or I kept at the forefront of my mind the truth about who I was, about who I am, and I kept at the forefront of my mind what it was that I was doing here on this earth, what it was that I was supposed to be doing with the life that had been given to me. Hold your place here, and real quickly, just want to show you a few verses. Look at Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 1. This is the first letter that we see or or we read of Paul's after the book of Acts. Uh, This may not be the first book he wrote chronologically as far as dates, but it's the first book we have in our our Bible after the book of Acts. And look at how he opens this this letter. Verse number 1 says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. He refers to himself here as a servant of Jesus Christ and an apostle. An apostle 
of course, is one who is given a, 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 a message, much like an ambassador, and is supposed to deliver that message. They've been given the authority to deliver this message. But before he even talks about being a messenger for God or an apostle for the Lord, he calls himself a servant. Why does he call himself a servant? Because that is how he saw himself. That is the mindset that he kept about himself. Uh, look over, if you would, with me real quickly to Titus chapter number 1. Titus chapter number 1. And in verse number 1, once again, a letter written by Paul the Apostle. And once again, we see in verse number 1 how he opens up this letter. He says, Paul, once again, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. You know, if you look at all of the letters that Paul wrote from Romans uh, to the end of the New Testament, every letter that he wrote that, that's, that's in the New Testament there, he opens it up by either saying that he is a servant or an apostle. In other words, that he is supposed to be a minister for the Lord or that he is supposed to be a message deliverer for the Lord. He opens up either by using one of those two terms in every letter except for one. I want you to look at one more, Philemon. Philemon, it comes right after Titus. Titus, Philemon. Look at Philemon 1.1. 1, 1. Here he says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul saw himself... Yes, as a messenger for the Lord, but before he saw himself as a messenger for the Lord, he saw himself as a servant of the Lord, but not only as a servant, but as a prisoner. That gives you a good uh, 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 illustration or a good mental picture of how he viewed himself. Because a, 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 an apostle, someone who's given a message to deliver, they have a choice in whether they deliver it or not. A servant also, even though under the Old Testament law, a servant really didn't have much of a choice. We know that a servant can still has a little bit of leeway and can uh, exert his will if he wants to. But a prisoner, a prisoner cannot do what he wants. A prisoner is at the mercy of the one who is holding him captive. Now we know that the Lord Jesus Christ freed him and has freed us. But remember that Paul talked about that if you're, uh, if you're saved, you're really a, a bond servant of the Lord. You're really a, a slave to Christ. You're either serving the Lord or you're serving the devil. You have a master. This is what he meant when he talked about humility. Turn back to Acts chapter number 20 with me, if you would, and look at verse number 19 again. And we see that he talks about serving the Lord with all humility of mind. In other words, as he ministered to the Ephesians, he kept before him this mindset. I am a servant. I am a message deliverer or a, an apostle. And I am a, a, a prisoner to Jesus Christ. Second, he says, and with many tears. Uh, and third, he says, many temptations. Now, I left tears out for a second here because I want uh, to illustrate this to you. The last thing he mentions is temptations. When he uses the word temptation, and whenever the word temptation is used in the Bible, we know that, and we're not changing the word of God, so please don't misunderstand me, but we know that that word could be replaced with the word testing. In the Old Testament book of Genesis, the Bible says that God tempted Abraham. We know that God, as we've said many times before, did not try to get Abraham to do wrong. He was tempted testing him. And so when it says God tempted Abraham, it means that God tested Abraham. When he writes this uh, here that he had served the Lord in temptations or with temptations, he means with testings. He goes on to say what these testings were, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. Remember back in uh, uh, Acts chapter number 19 in Ephesus, where the Jews got upset. Those that hadn't uh, turned to Jesus Christ got upset. And of course, they caused that uproar. Demetrius and the silversmiths caused that uproar in the city. And they uh, uh, stormed into the amphitheater and they had grabbed two of Paul's compatriots and, and, and companions and, they, and they, they rushed in there. This was a testing for Paul. Now think about this for a second. Paul had been stoned at Lystra. 
So he understood what persecution was all about. Paul had been persecuted throughout his first and second missionary journeys, but he had never had someone taken on his behalf into the amphitheater, or into the theater, I should say, uh, to be thrown out to the lions or to face the gladiators uh, till the death. He had never had anybody have to sacrifice themselves. And so here he was tested. And remember, he was ready to go into the theater, and he was uh, uh, about ready to rush in there. And then uh, the disciples and and those who had influence, who were uh, friends of his, uh, convinced him not to go in. He was tested. This was one of many testings. As he was there, remember when he first got to Ephesus, he was there in the synagogue, and there was uh, confusion among the Jews that were there. Some believed, some didn't believe, and he was forced to leave the synagogue because of the confusion and because it wasn't a, a place where he could preach the gospel openly and see results. And so he went to the school of Tyrannus all throughout his ministry in Ephesus. He was tempted. In other words, he was tested. So he says, hey, as I served the Lord, I served him with all humility of mind. I served him with temptations or with testings, with trials. And then the middle one, which I left out so I could come back to it on purpose, with tears. Now, I left it out because I really believe this is the key to Paul's service and the key to Paul's success in Ephesus were his tears. We know what the Bible says in Psalm 126, 5, how that they that uh, sow in tears shall reap in joy. They that go forth bearing precious seeds shall doubtless uh, 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 come again rejoicing, bringing their sheaves with them. We know uh, uh, how that he, he talks about, uh, uh, it's ta- it talks about in Lamentations 3, 51, mine eye affecteth mine heart. We know that tears are important, and I believe that they were influential in his ministry there in Ephesus. And the reason I left them out is because sometimes when we read about people crying, it's for selfish reasons. Or it's for personal, it has some type of personal motivation. Uh, I think back to Hezekiah, King Hezekiah in the Old Testament. The Bible tells us that the Lord, he saw the tears of King Hezekiah. And so he spared King Hezekiah. He was supposed to die. Hezekiah was supposed to. And God spared him and said, I'll give you 15 more years. Well, why was Hezekiah crying? There was some personal motivation. There was some selfishness there involved in his tears. Uh, We know that uh, throughout the Bible and even in our own lives, we probably shed tears. And many times they are selfish or personally motivated tears. Uh, But here we read how that he had tears and he served with tears and he mentions it after humility of mind. In other words, remembering who he was, but he, he mentions it before temptations, before testings. In other words, he cried before the testings came. So often our tears come because of the testings. He was already weeping. He was already pouring out tears in the city of Ephesus before any temptations or trials came his way. He was pouring out tears for the lost souls of Ephesus. I think of Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah the prophet was probably one of the most selfless individuals. A man who warned uh, the, the people of God day and night for years and years. And they would not listen. And Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. He wrote the book of Lamentations that I just quoted to you. Lamentations 3.51, mine eye eye affecteth mine heart. He wrote that. And and Lamentations, of course, comes from the word lament. He lamented. He cried. He shed tears. Jeremiah did. He didn't see much for results. But he cried nonetheless. Paul here says, hey, I served the Lord there in Ephesus, and I served him with humility, and I served him with testings and trials, but I served him with tears. And folks, I'll be honest with you tonight, I believe this is the key to serving God and being successful in service to God is tears. We need some tears once again. Tears not for ourselves, not because I'm hurting tonight. Uh, uh, not because I'm going through something difficult. Tears for somebody else who's lost, who's on their way to hell. Tears for somebody else who's struggling spiritually. We need tears once again, and we've got to ask God to give us those tears. Some of us, maybe it seems like our, to us, and even to God, 
as though our tear ducts have dried up on us. Because it's been a while since we've shed a tear for someone else. Paul says, this, this is what I did. I served the Lord. Then he goes on to talk about his service to the Ephesians here. If you look down to verse number 20 and 21 with me real quickly. He says here, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He talks first off when he when he mentions his uh, his service to the Ephesians. He mentions how that he testified here in verse number 21. He testified of the gospel in verse number uh, 21. He says uh, he, he says testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, repentance is when someone who is heading away from God stops and they turn away from their sin and turn towards God. He says, this is what I testified of. I testified of repentance, turning away from your sin, turning towards God. And then he mentions in verse 21, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So he mentioned repentance and faith. That's what he testified of. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. In verse 24, look at the end of that verse. He says, which I have received of the Lord Jesus talking about his ministry, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Verse 25, he goes on to say, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God. In verse 27, he says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. What did he testify of? He testified of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Secondly, he testified to everyone. In verse 21, you notice how he mentions testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. In other words, he was saying my ministry was to everyone, Jewish uh, people and Gentile people. In verse 26, look at the statement he makes here. He says, wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. I could not make that statement tonight, folks. I could not say, like Paul said, and I'm sure you could not say that tonight, that you're pure from the blood of all men. Why was he pure from the blood of all men? Because he warned everyone. He goes on to talk about not only the fact that he testified of the gospel and he testified to everyone, but that he testified every day for years. In verse number 31, and we read this on Sunday night. He says, therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. See the tears mentioned there again? The tears. He mentioned people night and day for three years. There was a story of a preacher who made a, a commitment that he was not going to go to bed uh, or lay his head down to go to bed until he had at least talked to one person that day about Jesus Christ. Maybe they wouldn't get saved, but at least he was going to present the gospel to one person every day. He had made a commitment to God. One night he had had a long day and he got home and he went to go to sleep after eating. And as he was laying down, the Holy Spirit reminded him of the vow he had made. And he began to think, oh, I need to get up and go out. But it was late late into the night, and he thought, no, no one's out there, and he battled, and, and finally he said, I've got to go, I made a commitment, I made a vow to God, I've, I've got to go out and at least try to find someone, and he went out and he searched through the city streets and found one person wandering around. He went up to that person, and he began to talk to that person, and when the conversation was done, he had the opportunity to win that person to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he made a commitment. He wasn't going to lay his head down on his pillow without warning someone at least every day. Giving out the gospel. Oh, that we would make this commitment, that we would testify to everyone of the gospel of Jesus Christ night and day. At least try to witness to one person. He then goes on to say in verse number 20 how that he taught. Not only did he, his service to the Ephesians involve testifying to them, which was preaching the gospel, but also how he taught. In verse 20, he says, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Real quickly in this verse, verse 20, he gives three things about his teaching. He says that he taught profitable things. How many things 
do we teach, do we talk about that are not profitable? He says, you elders, you leaders know that what I taught you, what I shared with you, it was always profitable. He says, you know that I taught publicly. I was not afraid to go out and talk to people uh, in the open about my faith, about my belief in Jesus Christ and in the scriptures. And finally, I taught privately. He had a balance here. He didn't just go out and, and, and uh, teach openly. He also spent time, as it says here in verse number 20, how he went from house to house. He ministered. This man, Paul, gave of his life for three years, preaching, or as he said, testifying, and then teaching these people after they were saved to help strengthen them in their faith, in their walk with God. His investment in others resulted in what we read about at the end of chapter number 20. Let me close with this illustration here as we finish with uh, finish this thought about uh, building friendships that will last forever. Paul loved God and he served God. Because he loved God and he served God, he ended up going to the Ephesians and serving them and uh, falling in love with the Ephesian people. Notice because he loved God first and served God first, he ended up loving the Ephesians and serving the Ephesians. At the same time, the Ephesians, as they got saved and he taught them, he testified to them and taught them, they learned to love God. They got saved and they loved God and they also served God and they loved Paul and they also served Paul. The result we see here is you have a two-way street. Paul served God and loved God which ended up resulting in him serving and loving the Ephesians. And the Ephesians, in retrospect, loved God and served God, so they loved Paul and served Paul. This is truly a friendship that will last forever. This is why these men on that, uh, uh, there on that soil in Miletus uh, knelt down with him and wept with him and fell on his neck and kissed him and embraced him. And when they were done, walked him down to the ship and saw him off for the last time and saw him as a brother and saw him as a father because they, uh, they had learned to love God and to love Paul. All because Paul started it. He loved God first and loved them second. With that in mind, tonight, if we as Christians want to build friendships that will last forever, we've got to love and serve God first. With humility, even with testings, and with tears. And as we love and serve God, He will put us in a position where we're able to serve others and when we have that opportunity to serve others, we need to make sure we testify, as Paul said, and that we teach these people, that we invest in them, that we don't just uh, uh, settle for saying hi to them on Sunday or, or saying hi to them on Wednesday, but that we actually invest in them, that we call on them, that we pray for them, that we visit them, that if we need to, we sit down with them and, and, and share Scripture from the Bible, that we do these things, and as we love God and serve Him and serve these other people, we will love them as well. And they, in turn, will learn to love God and serve God and love us and serve us. And we will truly have friendships that will last forever. People out in the world, we all were there at one time out in the world, lost, on our way to hell. We know how much stock is put into friendships but at the same time, we all know how that friendships are fleeting out in the world because so many friendships are built on the wrong foundation. Tonight, we need to make sure that we purpose that we are going to do everything in our power to love and serve God and serve, love and serve others so that we can build these friendships that will last forever. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you've done.